Hey everyone, I'm Brandon Robbins, and once again, we're going to take a look at an episode of The Chosen, breaking it down and helping you to see some of the context and history going on behind the scenes that's subtle and easy to overlook. Now, if you haven't seen my previous videos, you can find the links down in the description, and there should be one right up here. This week, we're going to take a look at Season 2, Episode 6. And in this episode, we're going to take a look at things like Mary's struggles, the arguments among the Pharisees, and what's really going on between Jesus and the religious leaders. So let's jump right into our first scene. Nine for sure. Nine is too much. I came in here with a single shekel to my name, and now look at this pile, huh? How did you get the first one, woman? Hmm? What did you do for it? Wouldn't you like to know? Hey, are we going to play or what? Get on with it. Hey. Watch and learn, boys. Watch and learn. Hey! Ah, mother of a dog! First time hoj, yeah? Hey, another. Another. So in this scene, we find Mary in a bar gambling with a group of men. Now you might remember that in the last episode, Mary was very shaken up by her experience with a demon-possessed man. It was a traumatic experience that reminded her of a time when she herself was possessed. And this event ends up sending Mary into a downward spiral. She leaves the rest of the disciples, and now we find her here. And this setting shows us just how bad things have gotten for Mary. As we can see, Mary is gambling. She's playing a game called Knuckle Bones. And this is actually a game that appears in many cultures across the globe throughout history. It appears to be an early version of dice. You would wager based on how you expected the bones to land. And in this way, you were essentially gambling the odds of the bones landing as you predicted. But gambling was not looked upon kindly in Jewish culture. Those who threw dice weren't actually allowed to serve as witnesses. The Mishnah says, these are considered unfit witnesses. Gamblers with dice, those that lend interest, pigeon racers, those who trade in produce of the sabbatical year, and slaves. And there are actually a few reasons given for this prohibition. Some saw gambling as theft. It was dishonest. It was a means of getting other people's money. Others said that it was only a problem if those who gambled had no other profession. But whatever the reason, there was definitely a stigma. And what we can see fairly certain in this episode is that this setting is not where you would expect to find a disciple of Jesus. It shows us how broken Mary is, her drinking, her gambling. She's trying to cover the pain that she feels. She's ashamed. And all of this just feels like a good distraction. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had those moments in your life that have just taken you to such a dark place that you just wanted to escape? Maybe you fell into drugs or alcohol or into the arms of another person. Maybe you walked away from your relationship with God for a while. Maybe, maybe you were mad at God or you didn't feel that you were good enough for God. Maybe, maybe that's how you feel today. Well, what I want you to hear in this moment is that you're not alone. One of the things that I think The Chosen does so well is that it helps us to see ourselves in the disciples, right? Their struggles mirror our struggles. Their questions mirror our questions. We aren't perfect, and guess what? Neither were they. You aren't alone in what you're going through, and soon we'll see that Jesus offers her and us a way out. For our next scene, we're going to witness an argument that might surprise and confuse us. The Pharisees are arguing with each other. And let's watch and see why. So all you're telling me is that he told somebody to carry his mat on Shabbat? And invokes the title Son of Man from the prophet Daniel. Yeah, many have. And maybe something happened at Capernaum, but you're not certain it was the same person. I am certain. Right. And your second witness? My colleague Yusuf. Was not at the pool and neither were you. I was there. I'm sorry, but this case is very thin. President Shimon, 
does not preoccupy himself with minutia. Minutia? If I may be so bold. Which violations of God's immutable law does President Shimon deem worthy of his attention? You're not listening, Yanni. Just like you haven't in the past. That is why you still hold a low station. These are the laws that Shimon, like his father Hillel, is seeking to reform. His care is for women, for widows, for uh, the, 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 uh, the undervalued, for the vulnerable. Yours seems to be about people carrying mats on Shabbat. Blasphemy is not harmless. Dunash, think of the political value. I'm only telling you that Shimon is extremely focused. He will not expend energy on this case. Shalom. Throughout The Chosen, we see that Jesus often comes into conflict with Pharisees. But one of the things that you may not realize is that not even all Pharisees thought alike. In fact, rabbis would generally side with one of two schools of thought, the disciples of Hillel or the disciples of Shammai. And let me take a moment to explain to you who those men are and how they fit into the conversation happening in this episode. See, the first school of thought was that of Hillel. Hillel Hazaken was born in 110 BC and died in 10 AD, and he is one of the most influential rabbis in Jewish history. We even can see moments that indicate that Jesus was familiar with the teachings of Hillel. For instance, Hillel was known for what was called the, the golden rule, or at least it's come to be called his golden rule. And what he said was, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is explanation. Go and learn. In other words, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. Well, Jesus adapted this teaching, telling his disciples, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. And so as you can see, even Jesus was familiar with Hillel and drew from his teachings to build his own teachings. But what's important to know about Hillel as it pertains to this episode are, are two specific things. First, Hillel wasn't the only person from his family to be influential in the Jewish community. Throughout the episode, you'll hear the rabbis refer to someone named Shimon. Now the Shimon they're referring to is Shimon ben Hillel, which means Simon the son of Hillel, who is said to have been the president of the Sanhedrin at that time. But when we look closely at the timeline, we see that there's another person who also may have been the president of the Sanhedrin at that moment, and that is Gamaliel I. And he is a really interesting man to look at. Gamaliel was the president of the Sanhedrin and a leading authority in the mid-first century. The book of Acts tells us that the Apostle Paul studied at the feet of Gamaliel, and that Gamaliel was instrumental in sparing the lives of Peter and other apostles as they were being prosecuted by the Sanhedrin. And this actually hints at the second thing that you should know about Hillel and Gamaliel, which is that the disciples of Hillel were known for being more lenient when it comes to the Torah. We see this reflected in a conversation in this episode. And in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus actually sides with the disciples of Hillel against the disciples of Shammai in a debate about divorce. And that's because the disciples of Shammai were much more strict in their interpretation and enforcement of the Torah. There's this saying, Shammai binds and Hillel looses. In other words, it was generally understood that Shammai leaned towards tougher restrictions and requirements, and Hillel offered more leeway. And that's essentially what we're seeing in this scene, right? These Pharisees who clearly agree with Shammai want strict adherence to the Sabbath requirements. They don't like that accommodations are being made for Jesus. On the other hand, though, the man that they're arguing with seems to be taking the approach of Hillel. He just doesn't show as much concern for Jesus's actions. And when we realize who these people are and how they're different, it's very important for us as we read scripture, right? It, it becomes very easy for us as we read the Bible to just create a caricature of the Pharisees. And they become this stereotypical villain who represents the opposite of everything that Jesus stands for. But the truth is that things simply aren't that black and white. I mean, just as there are a variety of opinions within the Christian community today, people varied in their opinions back then. 
Some people were predisposed to receive Jesus' teachings, and others, they just weren't. And one thing I often find myself wondering is, where would I have fallen? What camp would I have been in? I mean, if I had been raised by a father who was a disciple of Shammai, would I have been just as upset by what Jesus was doing? And if I was raised as a disciple of Hillel, would it have been easier for me to embrace Jesus? And then I find myself asking, well, well, how does my upbringing impact what I believe today? And where do I need to break free of that upbringing in order to be able to witness what the Spirit is trying to do right now, just as many rabbis would have had to do 2,000 years ago? For our next scene, we're going to look at some interactions Jesus and his disciples have at a remote synagogue. Let's watch. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the 10th generation, none of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way. Shalom. Even to the 10th generation, none of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. May I, may I see? Because they did not meet you with bread and with what? Excuse me, what are you doing? What is your name? Elam. Your friend Elam has a withered hand. Are you a healer? It is not lawful to heal on Sabbath. Which one of you? who has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath will not take hold of it and lift it out. Who are you to speak to our congregation in such a of way? how much more value is this man than a Stop sheep? Stop this at once! <laughs> no, get back! Please. Out of the way! You have made a mockery of our little synagogue and of Torah. You will tell us your name, your lineage, your... virtue, and now your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Have you not read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He entered the house of God in the time of Ahimelech, the priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, but only for the priests. You would compare yourself to David. It was an emergency. Or have you not read in the law how on Shabbat the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, but are guiltless? That's for Levites. Are you a Levite of priestly lineage? Listen carefully. Something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So, the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Son of man. Let's go. Okay, so the scene we just watched depicts for us the events of Matthew 12. And as we enter this scene, we learn that the disciples are in a place called Wadi Kelt. Wadi Kelt is a river valley that goes from Jerusalem to Jericho and empties into the Dead Sea. And given its prominent location, it's a place that is connected with many people and events of the Bible. Part of it is mentioned in Joshua as he's traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem. In 1 Kings, Elijah hides in part of the Wadi Kelt. And in this scene, we see that a synagogue has been built out in an open area along this path. The Wadi Kelt synagogue was established between 70 and 50 BC in part of a winter palace built by the Hasmoneans. And as Jesus and his disciples enter this synagogue, they hear the rabbi reading from the Torah. He's actually quoting from Deuteronomy 23, a passage about who's excluded from the assembly and how there is to be no uncleanness in the Israelite camp, which is really interesting because as he's reading this, we notice that there is a man whose hand is afflicted with some sort of disease or disability. And if what is impacting his hand is some sort of skin disease, then he's not clean. So not only does Jesus approach a man who may be unclean, 
but he disrupts the reading of the scriptures and offers to heal this man on the Sabbath. And then when they leave the synagogue, the rabbis witness Peter picking and eating grain on the Sabbath. And so this whole situation just ends up being one big conflict between Jesus and these religious leaders. Now, as we've seen, this isn't the first time that Jesus has healed on the Sabbath. He's actually done this multiple times, and it gets him in trouble every single time. What's unique about this scene, though, is that we begin to see Jesus' explanation for why he's doing this. Now, one thing that is always important for us to understand is that there is nothing in the Torah prohibiting the things that Jesus has been doing. The law does not say that you cannot heal on the Sabbath. That rule actually comes from an oral tradition that's called the 39 Melachot. And basically, these are 39 categories of activity that are prohibited on the Sabbath. 39 categories of things that constitute work. Things like planting a field or preparing food or dyeing cloth. Now, the intention is that these requirements will help people to observe this day of rest, and as scripture says, keep it holy. But what Jesus is trying to show these religious leaders is that they're actually doing the opposite. They're missing the point of the Sabbath. I mean, Jesus very clearly says that we weren't created for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for us. In other words, the Sabbath is God's gift to us. It's meant to be a blessing. But by standing in the way of healing this man, these religious leaders are preventing God's blessing, which goes against the very spirit of the Sabbath. There's more though, right? In adhering to these requirements, these religious leaders are actually ignoring the scripture itself. Jesus mentions a situation in which David went and ate bread that was in the temple. And he's referring to an event that took place in 1 Samuel 21 in which David and the men with him are in need of food. And so David goes to Ahimelech the priest, who tells him that the only food available is the consecrated bread in the temple. And what Jesus is pointing out is that even though they shouldn't be eating this bread, the priest gives it to David because they're in need. Which makes even more sense when you look at the next thing that Jesus says. He looks at the religious leaders and he says, If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, then you would not have condemned the innocent. In other words, through this story, through the healing of the man, through his question, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Through all of these things, he's showing these men That rather than allowing the Sabbath to bless people with rest, they're causing it to burden people with stress. The hungry stay hungry. The sick stay sick. The tired remain exhausted. The gift is no longer a gift. But here's something really ironic that I've realized. We know this, right? We, We get what Jesus is saying. 2,000 years later, most of us living outside of the Jewish community, we have the convenience of looking at these requirements from a distance and saying, yeah, that's not what God intended. We definitely don't get bound up in putting too many restrictions on the Sabbath, but, but here's the problem. Here's what I've noticed. Many of us have gone too far in the other direction. Instead of overburdening ourselves in order to faithfully observe the Sabbath, we just don't really practice the Sabbath at all. And when I say that, I'm I'm not talking about worship or the Saturday-Sunday debate. I'm talking about rest. Too many of us just don't rest. And and let me just admit, right, I I struggle with this, right? I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I run a YouTube channel. I try to read like four books a week. I moonlight as the spokesperson for bald Bible boys. I mean, rest for me isn't a habit. It's a decision. It's something I have to choose to do. It, it's not natural. And here's the thing that I fall into. Maybe you, maybe you do this too. On my days of rest, I find other ways to exhaust myself. Like on my day off, we'll plan to run errands around town, clean the garage, babysit an avocado plant, and like 50 other things. And when I head back to work, I'm more exhausted than I was before I took off. And here's the thing, right? I 
I, I think you can actively rest. I mean, going to the gym refreshes me. Spending a day riding roller coasters with my daughter refreshes me. I think active rest is a thing. But where I find that we so often get into trouble is that we aren't aware of what replenishes us and what exhausts us. And in the end, we just spend most of our lives being drained. And let me just say that this is not what God intended for us. God didn't intend for us to have dozens of restrictions to make sure that we don't do a bit of work. But at the same time, God also didn't intend for us to remain exhausted all the time because we never rest. That's not keeping the Sabbath holy. That's not receiving the gift that God's offering us. And so I want to I want to give you a challenge this week. Set aside a day this week to truly rest. Maybe you get some extra sleep that day, right? Or maybe you spend some extra time reading scripture. Maybe you do some other things that replenish you. But take a day to truly rest. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is all there is to the Sabbath, but, but this is a big part of the Sabbath that many of us miss. And while you're taking this day of rest, plan your future days of rest. Plan time each week where you're going to observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. Because the truth is, we don't do what we're supposed to do. We do what we plan to do. And as crazy as it sounds, one of the things that many of us need to plan to do is embrace God's gift of rest. For our final clip, we're going to look at some controversial scenes in this episode. We're going to look at Mary's struggles with her relapse, her feelings as she approaches Jesus, and how it is that she is finally reconciled with her Lord. Let's watch. Mary! I thought I was dreaming you. Can you walk? I'm not going anywhere. We have to go back. No, I can't. Come on, Mary. He told us to come for you. No, <laughs> no. He already fixed me once. And I broke again. I'm... I'm so ashamed. <laughs> you redeemed me and I just threw it all away. Well, that's not much of a redemption if it can be lost in a day, is it? Yeah. I owe you everything. But I just don't think I can do it. Do what? Live up to it. Repay you. How could I leave? How could I go back to the place I was? And I didn't even... I didn't even come back on my own. They had to come get me. <sighs> I just can't live up to it. Well, that's true. <laughs> but you don't have to. I just want your heart. A father just wants your heart. Give us that which you already have. And the rest will come in time. As I said earlier, the scenes we just watched, and really the whole story of Mary in this episode, has sparked a lot of controversy. I mean, the response to this was so strong that Dallas Jenkins himself even had to address these concerns in a video. And one of the main frustrations that people have had with Mary's story in this episode was the very idea that Mary could fall back into sin. People just couldn't believe that if Mary had been healed by Jesus, she could ever revert to her old ways, especially if she was so close to Jesus. So what does scripture say about this? The scripture suggests that when we give our lives to Jesus, we never fall back into our old ways. And if we do fall back into sin, does that mean that maybe our salvation wasn't real? What do we do with the fact that Jesus tells the people that he's healed to go and sin no more? How do we handle verses like John 10, 28, where Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. I mean, that sure sounds like a promise that we'll never fall back into sin. But this is where I think it's really important for us to take a step back and look at the whole of scripture and the whole of Jesus's message. You see, when we do this, when we look at the entirety of scripture, what we really see is a story of people constantly struggling with sin. 
I mean, just look at the Exodus story. For 400 years, the Israelite people cried out to be freed from slavery. And so God frees them in big ways. God makes God's presence very, very obvious. But what happens as soon as the people are free? They start to doubt God and they begin to worship a golden idol. I mean, if anyone should be convinced and transformed, it is this group of people. These people were standing with one of the most important prophets in Jewish history, Moses. They were at the foot of a mountain where God's presence dwelled. They were freed after plagues and miracles. They had no excuse to backslide. But their proof that no matter how amazing the transformation, no matter how close we are to God, this is something that can happen to all of us. We see it with David who sinned even though he was a man after God's own heart. We see it with Peter, who denied Jesus after promising to die for him. And we see it in the early churches, who came to Christ through the ministry of Paul and then fell into a variety of sins. And of course, we see it in our own lives. I mean, I've been following Christ for over 20 years. I've devoted my whole life to him and I still struggle. I've watched people who love Jesus with every ounce of who they are, go through awful seasons of temptation and struggle and sin. We are constantly fighting our demons, our temptations, the parts of us that are weak and broken. And what I think is so important to remember is how Paul describes salvation. Paul doesn't just say that we are saved. Paul says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Salvation isn't just a moment. Salvation is a process. It's something that happens our entire lives. There may be a moment when we give our lives to Christ, when we embrace him as our Lord and Savior, but the rest of our lives, we are being saved. We are being molded into his image. We are growing in our love for him. And this is what Mary is going through. Mary never stopped loving Jesus. She never stopped believing that he was the Messiah, but she walked away from him. She stepped away from that relationship. And maybe that's how some of you feel today. You've walked away from your relationship with Jesus. Maybe you were mad at God. Maybe you fell into sin. Maybe maybe you were in a really dark place, but you walked away. You tried to save yourself. You you try to distract yourself, but you know that this isn't where you want to be. And what I want you to see in this episode are several really important things that happened to Mary. I mean, the first thing is that Mary is reconnected to Jesus through relationship. Matthew and Simon go to find her. They bring her back. They are her family and they don't want her to be separated from Jesus. And if you've got people in your life who are trying to reach you, but you're pushing them away, I want you to see Mary's response. She lets them lead her back to Jesus. She she may not want to go, but she lets them lead her back. And if you're someone who knows someone who's lost right now, I want you to realize that God may be calling upon you to help bring them back to Jesus. The second thing we see with Mary is that when Mary does return to Jesus, she repents. She confesses that she's she's done wrong. She admits her fears. And and I love how Jesus responds and, and how she responds. She says, I don't think I can do it. Live up to it. And he says, you don't have to. I just want your heart. The rest will come in time. She's worried that she's not perfect. She sees this image of who she knows she should be. And the struggle makes her feel imperfect and unworthy. And yet Jesus tells her it's not about that. It's not about her being good enough. If she were good enough, she'd be her own savior, right? It's it's about the fact that he is good enough. He is her savior. And, And then finally, the last and most important thing we see Mary do is she surrenders. She falls into Jesus's arms and she accepts his salvation all over again. And that's what Jesus is inviting us to do. If this, is, if this is you, if you feel like Mary, if you've been made to feel shame, if you, if you don't feel worthy of being Jesus' disciple, then I want you to hear Jesus' words from this episode. 
You don't have to be. He just wants your heart. The rest will come in time. Jesus is proof that God understands our struggles. God has been with us. God has been one of us. God is not just a God of distant judgment. God is a God of compassion. Jesus has felt our temptation, borne our sins, and risen so that we can have a new life. And I want to give you the opportunity to experience that new life today. If you're like Mary and you're feeling distant from Jesus, right? Your, your past has caught up with you. Your sins have gotten a hold of you. I want to invite you to come before Jesus just like Mary and confess and repent and invite Jesus to make you new to heal you and cleanse you through the power of his death and to give you a new life through the power of his resurrection, that you might continue to be saved each and every day. And so if if this is where you are today, then I want to invite you to pray with me right now. Let's pray. Jesus, we surrender ourselves to you right now. We know that we've sinned. We know that we've walked away from you. We know that we continue to struggle each day to be the disciples that you've called us to be. But we also know that your grace is bigger than our weakness. And so we lay ourselves before you right now. We surrender our hearts to you. We confess our sins. We repent of every one of the moments that we've walked away from you, denied you, rejected you. And we ask for your forgiveness. Please give us a new life, Lord one in which we continue to be saved by you, changed by you, and molded into your image each and every day. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't done so already, please take a moment to click that thumbs up to say that you like the video. And then, while you're down there, click that subscribe button and the bell next to it so that you hear about these videos as soon as they are released. Also, If you haven't already signed up for our monthly newsletter, then check out the description where you'll find a subscription link. Each month, we will take you beyond the video with insights and details that I couldn't include in videos like this one. We'll take you beyond the words, helping you to see familiar scriptures in a whole new way. And we'll take you beyond the walls, helping you to see how you can live all of this out and be a part of the mission of bringing God's kingdom here to earth. I'm really excited about this, so make sure that you check out that link and subscribe. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to watch these videos. I can't even tell you how grateful I am. But until next time, have a great week and God bless.